Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks all for joining our spaces today. So in December, Worldcoin Foundation announced its first and inaugural Worldcoin Foundation Community Grants Wave Zero. And today we're excited to announce the recipients of Wave Zero and highlight a couple of them and look at what's being worked on and just what's up next. Hi, I'm Remco. I'm leading blockchain at the Worldcoin Foundation. And today I'm joined by Ken. Ken, would you please introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. My name is Ken. I lead applied research at the Udisaw Foundation, and I'm helping to advise the Worldcoin Foundation on their community grants program. It's been a lot of fun to see the growth in really only five and a half weeks. So I'm super excited to be here and really excited to talk through some of the grants that we have and the kind of pick your brain on what you find most important, what you've seen, some of the cool things and what's coming up next. That is cool. Yes. Looking forward to it. We are also joined by DC Builder, who recently joined the Worldcoin Foundation. DC, would you introduce yourself? Hello. Yes, I'm DC. I'm a research engineer at the Worldcoin Foundation and was previously a research engineer at Tools for Humanity, or one of the main developing companies of the Worldcoin project. And yeah, I'm excited to, to announce this upcoming grants recipient wave. Cool. And we're also joined by some of the recipients. So exciting to talk to them. We'll do our best at the end to answer any questions you may have. So drop them in the chat associated to the space and we'll go through them. So let's start. What is the grants program? The Worldcoin Foundation grants program is there to help advance what we call the Worldcoin tech tree, a whole number of things that we, that have dependencies and that we need to see executed to realize the, uh, the vision we have with the project. And a lot of that revolves around digital identity. It revolves around scaling blockchains to actually host a billion people and, and build a whole thriving community of developers around it. So for anyone who isn't familiar with all the components of the Worldcoin tech tree, there are some great areas for building. And we've categorized them in five different categories, and I'll quickly go through them. So the first one, of course, is World ID applications. We now have this very unique thing on chain where you can prove that you're a unique human being that hasn't done a particular thing before. This is being used in um, a number of civil protection schemes, but there's a lot more that you can do with it. You could, for example, create an NFT that every human only gets to claim once or you could have on-chain voting that actually implement one person, one vote and not token-based voting and so on. Um, so very excited about all the applications we got for using the world ID primitives. There's definitely more that can be done there than even we imagined. Uh, the second category is world ID protocol. Uh, like I mentioned, building this and actually making it scale to, uh, to our ambitions is an effort and requires lots of new innovations in the area of um, scaling blockchains. But also on the front of uh, cryptography, there is more that can be done. Uh, we, we had great examples of projects working on uh, zero-knowledge machine learning, uh, something that can help improve the user experience of any upgrades on the protocol. The third um, category is the user agent. So right now there is the world app built by tools for humanity, but of course the protocol itself is neutral and anyone can build a user agent for it. So innovations in this area are also very welcome. Um, the current app is very much targeting, uh, early users. So part of the invitation was, Hey, can you build an app, for example, that is extreme privacy preserving, like fully anonymous, or can you build an app that is for the absolute sophisticated DeFi users and so on? It will be interesting to see an, uh, a diversity of user agents, agents grow out of this. The fourth uh, category we have uh, in Wave Zero is, is a very exciting one. It's, it's on the hardware itself. As you know, um, probably Worldcoin has these orbs uh, that um, help you during the signup process for the protocol. And it is very important for us that these orbs are as incredibly neutral and reliable and trustworthy as they could possibly be. And one thing that would tremendously help here, if there is a second manufacturer of them. So we have a good chunk of Wave Zero dedicated to making that happen. And the third one is operations. Getting people onboarded into the protocol is an endeavor and any ideas that contrib uh, contribute to, to this effort is a very good 
proposal for the community grants program. These are non-exhaustive. There are many more things that you could do that would help the, that would help the project and that would build us down the tech tree. And this is very much a, a large community effort. So in Wave Zero, it's also been about raising awareness and giving people like an idea of the sort of things that would be interesting uh, for, for us to work on together. So Ken, um, you, you have a lot of experience of running uh, community grants programs like this. Could you tell a little bit more about what it's like for a larger community initiative to drive behind a protocol and what have you seen in the past in order to make this happen? Yeah, that's a, uh, I'd love to dive into that. I also just want to just call out like how awesome it is that, um, like one, we're calling this advancing the world's coin tech tree, a big sim player, but also like, uh, it's just so clearly laid out of like where the opportunities are uh, for growth. Uh, and it, it, like one of the things, and I, I promise I'll answer the question, but one of the things that I think is really important for how we think through grants programs is grants are here to empower developers, empower builders, empower community organizers. It, it's here to serve a purpose to create a positive impact, right? And as we think about like, what impact actually means, it's not like investing. It's not like you're writing a check and waiting for a company to hunt a thousand X. What you're really looking for here is like compounding effects that we can all build off of. We're looking for this positive sum growth of organizers, of builders, and really kind of what it comes down to is like identifying and expanding the service areas for people to meaningfully contribute. And so it's really cool that we can have this tech tree laid out in this manner because it, it is very clear, right? Like there are things that need to be worked on. Now, opening this back up to the other grants programs, I think kind of similar to DeFi and even in Ethereum, right? Like <laughs> early Ethereum, there's just like so much to do. How do you prioritize like, what is the most urgent thing that we have to tackle now? What is the most important stuff that we need to do long-term for the future of this? WorldCoin kind of presents like an opportunity where all of this is really out in the open. There's so much to do. And I think there's also stuff that we just don't know yet, right? Things will continue to pop up. And I guess like I, what's really cool about this is truly the global community of how people can really kind of make an impact, right? It's kind of identifying like what exactly it is that they can do and how the WorldCoin grants program can give agency to the people who previously did not have these opportunities. So it's really cool to see. And, and I guess I want to actually throw this back to DC as well, because DC, you've been no pun intended, or maybe it is intended, but you've been a builder for, you know, a long time. What nerd sniped you into WorldCoin? What was that point for you? And I think that is like a clear example of how others are, are getting nerd sniped. Yes, for me, um, when, when um, I was originally looking for a place where I can unsettle in and work on for a longer period of time, I was looking for cool research problems and engineering problems around the area of zero knowledge cryptography, which was something that I was really passionate about at the time and still am. And uh, just like the, when I was looking at different projects, a lot of the projects are either already very saturated with other teams. Let's say if you're thinking about scalability, ZK rollups, there's already like many teams working on that, but there's not as many people working on privacy preserving personhood. So like uh, when I was thinking about like, what sort of team should I join and what sort of mission makes sense to me and something that I can get behind fully, I, I was looking at WorldCoin for, that, for, for, for those sorts of reasons. And I had friends that were already working at Tools for Humanity. Eventually, I decided to join to work on this protocol that we're building, World ID. And uh, in order for me to learn about better, like how to become a better engineer, how to build ZK systems, how to learn more cryptography and how to build uh, a solution that has real impact in the world. So I feel like that's like the combination of like cool bleeding edge technology and true impact in the real world for real users. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so question, Ken, um, World ID was designed with the belief that privacy is a fundamental human right and that such a system should be a public good. What are a few examples of projects you think we might be seeing coming out of this work? Oh, dude, that's, <laughs> that's a tough one. I guess like centralized identity and, and just identity in general is, is like, I think one of the most difficult things to tackle is like not just from a technical adoption standpoint, but also just like when you think about how you have to build 
you know, DID systems, it comes with so many trade-offs and, and thinking about like, what is most important. Like, what do you value in actually having identity? How much access control do you want to provide? And how private do you want to be with this information, right? So I think like there's, it's not, yeah, it's a really hard question to answer because obviously, yeah, as you mentioned, like, yes, it is a fundamental human right and we should be able to as humans protect who we are and, and not not have to make concessions about like revealing our private information. So I guess like we think about like the real world, IRL people, refugees, migrants, citizens, I think like anyone along the spectrum we have to always think about protecting vulnerable populations, right? Look at all the work that's been done in the Human Rights Foundation on like so many sides, right? You have to, we really have to think about what exploitation has looked like in the past and really kind of work backwards in a more sort of grassroots manner. I think one of the biggest problems that at least that I've seen is that we've tried, at least in Web3, we've tried to build, I guess this is Web2 as well. No shit, and maybe a little. Uh, we, there's been so many times where, you know, we as a Western or whatever country comes into a underserved community and, and tell them like, this is the solution. This is what's going to solve your problem because this works for us. And it just like doesn't really work that way. So like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert on identity, but I think like this is an extremely important problem that we need to solve. I think. When we have something like WorldCoin and, and we see the accessibility for um, so many people across the world, I think it really kind of opens your eyes to think through, you know, how do we actually build solutions from the ground up? How do we build grassroots tooling? So that like, this is something that serves us, right? We know exactly what we need in a identity solution and, and it should be created from the people who are actually experiencing the issues here, not not necessarily trying to shove in a one size fits all. I think like one thing that's that's really cool to see this or to see like in, in WorldCoin is like there's such a commitment to open source and, and privacy preservation. Uh, so I guess like everything has been, at least so far, has been really cool to watch the updates come come alive. And, and I guess I want to throw this back at, at you, Remco, and also I guess DCU as well. Like, you guys are so committed to to building something that's that's uh, that's for the people and something that protects people. What have you seen uh, as like the biggest pain point for World ID so far? And you know what opportunities are there for others to help out and contribute? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, I fully agree with the importance of of uh, privacy and digital identity here, and that that's what actually drew me through the Volcoin project in the first place. Um, for me, it was pretty clear from the beginning that proof of being a unique human being is just the starting point of a much larger development in, in the field of digital identity and is going to be important as we already see with um, how easy it is to generate fake identities online these days with the tools that are available. So digital identity will become a harder problem and one that will be more critical and pressing to solve. And just the fact that you can prove that you're a human being and not a machine to me seems like the perfect starting point. And then doing this, not from like a web two classical business, but actually starting it out as a decentralized, like Pfeiffer punk valued business that holds values like self custodialness and control and um, user empowerment so close. I think that's, that is awesome that we can do it that way. And, um, Excited to make that work. DC, how about you? For me, I, I guess the biggest reason why we, I, we've seen like some form of struggle with integrating World ID in like other solutions uh, or like having third parties integrate World ID for their own solutions is uh, mostly that users do not, or like app developers do not want to restrict their user base to just people that have a World ID just yet. So I think like one of the, the biggest problems that we need to tackle is like this network effect issue where we need to have more users on board onto World ID so that then World ID is a more interesting solution for building SID resistant applications because now more users are able to access the application so they have a proof of personhood. I think this is just something that's going to take time until like bigger applications that uh, have more users are willing to sort of have certain offerings. 
that uh, are just for unique people and use world ID as the sole or like as one of the main um, ways of, of proving personhood. Uh, other than that, I think we also need to do a better job at educating like what you can do with world ID and, and helping improve whether it's documentation or just educational resources that people can follow to integrate different, different parts of the stack into their own applications. But yeah, th those two, I think, are the most important ones, in my opinion, currently. Yeah, I agree. Definitely with Ethereum wider, there is now kind of this, this tension between, between growth and, and sticking to very rigorous security principles. And you can see Ethereum at points being overtaken by, by chains that make a different trade-off here. Good thing, though, that we have L2s that allow different applications to make their own compromises here. And and excited that some of the Wave 1, uh, sorry, Wave 0 applicants will further that field. Shifting a little bit, uh, Ken, like, like I mentioned before, you've seen so many grants program happen. Could you talk a little bit about how, how like, uh, I'm sure all of them are unique and have their own killers about it. I'm curious, what, what do you think is unique about the WorldCoin Wave 0 from what you've seen? Oh, that's a fun question. What is different about WorldCoin Wave Zero? It's like asking who's your favorite child, right? I think for WorldCoin, one thing that's been really awesome to see is like, so first of all, let's step back and think like, dude, we, like, the WorldCoin Foundation Grants Program received over a thousand applications in under six weeks. I don't, I've never seen that many applications before. And also like the breadth. And like the breadth of not just like the projects, but the types of people who are applying for grants is, is was like absolutely insane. It's like just so cool to see like how many things people want to build from across the world. And I guess like what that shows to me is how like just how accessible WorldCoin has been around the world, right? Like how, how much it's been able to really get into the mindshare of like truly like, get into the mindshare of, of people uh, across the world to either like build something, contribute to something, contribute to open source repos, or just like wanting to run a meetup, um, run hackathons. And it's not even so much as though it's like, I want to do, I want to do a meetup to, to get people registered. Like, right. There's like so much more than that. It's like genuine interest in, in talking about what world ID means, what the applications do. And then you have the other range of the spectrum where it's like highly technical. I'm excited for you to start introducing grantees after this because like it, it is like so cool to see the range of opportunities that have been available here. But I guess like when we think about what, I, I, going back to the earlier point that I made was like, what is the impact that we're having here, right? And how do we define the type of impact that's being created? It's not so clear cut, right? Looking at other grants programs, looking at like the EFs, looking at even like Uniswap things that I've been a part of, or you know, any of the DeFi ones looking at ENS, uh, Optimism, Retro PGS, right? There's so many different ways that we're looking at impact and how we actually quantify and qualify the positive impact that grantees or even like community organizers, builders across the world who aren't grantees, like the amount of impact that they're having is, is just immense. So I think like, as we think through this, I don't want to be <laughs> repetitive, but the the infinite garden that Ethereum kind of talks about. It's been super cool to see from the world coin perspective how these opportunities are just sort of like laid out and they don't really we're not it's not really defining exactly what it is that like um it's not charting the path getting to a point, right? We're seeing like different stops on the along the rides of the destination and sort of like letting the community draw whatever scalar path we want to get there and that's really awesome right because that's not necessarily looking at the end outcome as the impact that can be had we're looking at how the journey to getting there creates positive impact and creates more opportunities for others to eventually get to the outcome right and that to me is, is really cool and, and very unique uh, in a way that I think is like very different than what Ethereum, uh, what the Ethereum ecosystem like wanted to see from, I don't know, 20, I guess 2015 onwards, but like since grants were around from like 2017 onwards, right? It, it's just like a very different perspective and it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a different level of like intimacy for like how how the community is able to like lean in, 
how accessible it is to lean in. Sorry, that was a very long way to answer that. But it is, yeah, it's generally like how, to me, this feels like it's growing. No, that's, uh, that's amazing. I think it's time to introduce some of the ground recipients. I think we have almost 10 of them in the, uh, in the spaces, but let's start with the team we all know and love, L2Beat. Kareste, could you uh, quickly, since we have 10, 10 of you, could you in two to three minutes explain what the ground application is about? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm Chris uh, from L2Beat. I'm the governor seat at L2Beat. And what we wanted to do is, as you might know, we at L2Beat, we do verify uh, all those uh, L2 systems and we verify what they're doing on chain. So whenever something changes on chain, we actually catch it up and we can tell everybody that, for example, some multisig uh, participants had changed or that somebody tries to upgrade their smart contract. However, we realize that with uh, all those ZK uh, systems, it's not that easy because the, the, the thing that we see from the on-chain perspective when the ZK profile changes, is just like two strange numbers uh, that, um, uh, that, that are those um, verified keys and it doesn't tell us much. And we know that some people also don't know what do they mean, so we need to verify them. So we like, we feel the urge to actually verify what that means. Is it actually consistent with the source code that the team published and that they're stating that this verify keys represent uh, what the source code code represents? And we want to check it. What we also want to check is we want to expose what is the proving stack used to generate the proofs in the ZK system, because those, 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 those proving stacks differ and we need to start digging into that. On top of that, we want to be able to verify the trusted setup that, been, that has been used by the given system. And we also want to check all the changes happening in those systems. So whenever an ZK rollup or an ZK bridge changes something, we want to be able to verify whether those changes that happen that we can see on chain, whether they reflect actually the changes that the team announced. And we started working on it and we applied for a grant to actually, to actually build this framework, like with the tooling that will help us do it. We will start with verifying all the world coins ZK circuits, but down the road, we also plan on actually building the framework, the kind of a guideline of how can anyone do it themselves and how to verify those ZK circuits quickly and, and, and continuously whenever they change. And that the scope of our grant, that's something that we want to deliver within this project. That is awesome. Keeping everyone honest as always. Cool. Let's quickly move on to the next one, XX Network. Aaron Wellwood and Art Carbeck, could you introduce the project quickly? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually not sure if Rick is going to be available uh, this morning, but uh, yeah, I'll get started. I don't want to take too much time because you do have quite a few people. So yeah, my name is Aaron Wellwood. I'm a director for the XX Foundation, uh, which is essentially the supporting entity behind the XX network. Yeah, we're committed to growing Web3 ecosystems and we prioritize privacy and security and transparency when doing that. So regarding this particular project, the aim of it is to work with uh, with you guys, the WorldCoin Foundation, enhancing the security for users through, through privacy using uh, the CMIX technology that the XX network has undergirding it. In the, I think it was called the network traffic anonymizer when we were looking at your RFPs uh, a while ago and we're like, wow, this is uh, pretty much a perfect fit for what uh, we've been building for years. So you were looking for a particular privacy solution for your users. And yeah, we have the perfect infrastructure to help with that. So we were super excited to see how committed the WorldCoin uh, Foundation was to privacy and really our, our MOs align in that regard. I notice on your, on your main webpage, you have like a particular tagline for every human privacy first owned by everyone. And yeah, when we saw that, we were like, wow, this is a perfect fit. We're super excited to work with you guys. So with that in mind, what the heck is CMIX and what's this MixNet technology for? Well, it's basically like a global decentralized MixNet. It uses 
try to keep it simple here. I don't have our tech lead Rick with us, but it's basically an advanced anonymization and encryption protocol that, you know, basically gives user security against global adversaries protecting their metadata so that people can't do traffic analysis on users and, and break privacy. And uh, that's pretty important when you're dealing with all these user IDs and the transactions that are going back, back and forth across a network. Right? So th there's some of these terms here that a lot of people don't understand. Metadata, what is metadata? It's basically the information that describes other data, like date, time, location, creator details of that data. It's essentially, it's key in digital communication uh, and it tracks who communicates with who and when that happens. And it, it's very revealing. A lot of people think of end-to-end -end encryption as the key thing that you need to keep your data secure, but actually metadata in a lot of ways is, is as important or more important than the encryption itself, because metadata will risk your privacy by showing communication patterns or what we call traffic analysis. I'm sure you guys understand that, which is why you want to make sure that base is covered. But uh, CMIX as a mix that basically shuffles data and hides the sender and receiver links and essentially safeguards against any tracking that could happen, even from global, global adversaries. So yeah, I, I don't want to get too techy, but that's essentially it. And we're aiming to integrate with you guys in such a way, or at least help in that way so that we can bolster the privacy and uh, ultimately the security of your, of your users. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Yes, that's really exciting. I think, um, privacy of like your IP address and, and that sort of tracking on, on a yes. wallet level is something that is very much underexplored still in Ethereum space. So really looking forward to this one. Um, yeah, next. very well. Thank you. I thank you. ID Masters, Bayan Shah, would you, would you like to talk about the project and the grant application? Yes, sounds good. Thank you very much for having us. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Great. My name is Bijan and I'm here with um, Behzad, who's my partner in our new project, ID Master. We're very excited about um, the World ID Promise and we actually think that ID is a human right a type of an ID that is equal in functionality and in privacy, in independence, that's a human right. And we would lastly contribute to its adoption around the globe. So our first project that we've defined for ourselves is we thought about how making it easier to manufacture the orbs will make it easier for World ID to, to have adoption around the world. So the first thing that we're going to be working on is to make it easier uh, to have a manufacturing process for ORP. We're going to basically create our own ORP using the specifications, documentations that are available. Our goal is that eventually we're able to make it so easy for the work ID ecosystem so that anybody around the world can look at a set of documentations. They can look at the parts that could be used and eventually maybe just put together an ORP that still delivers the same security, the same functionalities, that make it easier for people to come on board into the World ID platform. So um, that's our first project. I'm hoping that by the end of this project, we will have a lot of great documentations and videos for the community. Um, we've created a strong set of guidance for anybody who might be interested in doing this as well. And both Behzad and I have been in uh, Web3 for a while. Behzad is a in cryptographer, uh, PhD in cryptography, and I've also been in zero knowledge. And previously, I was head of product at Mino Protocol, which is a zero knowledge based project. So I think uh, the, the zero knowledge aspect and the privacy preserving aspect of World ID really resonates with us. And we're very excited about taking a path that makes it easier to drive adoption of World ID over the, over the next few months and years to come. Yes, this is super important. Empowering users and self-sovereignty is only worth so much if um, you don't also educate your users very well. Thank you. Next up, Nedamines. Mihao, would you like to explain the, uh, would you introduce the project and the grant applications, plural even? 
Yes, yeah. N Nethermind team is is very happy to announce that that, that we got uh, four four grants from a uh, World Foundation. So let me briefly introduce them. So our, our first proposal was about bringing Worldcoin to to Starknet. So we will be providing a bridge so that the bridge will be will be trusted, and will be based on zk proof for L1 to, to, L2 to message that will ensure that uh, the transmitted data occurred in the L1 block that verified L2. Why this is, why we went with this particular design is that although you can send a message from L1 to L2, this is not exactly cheap, especially when, uh, when the gas prices are, are high. So. Instead of that, we'd like to use uh, Fossil that was historically developed uh, by, by Euler. And Fossil is a tool that bridges the block hash of Ethereum and uses state proofs to prove the value of the block rule. So basically, the cost of sending a, a message from L1 to L2 is amortized by everybody that is interested in uh, bridging Ethereum state to, to start with. Another, another project we have and this project will be will be led by our core team the team that develops nethermind client is on a gas limit so we'd like to answer the question how much we can increase the the gas limits uh, so the ethereum client can handle it so we want to do a, a set of experiments and set of benchmark and have uh, data driven research on how gas limits in, in AVM chains can look like. So I would say that what we are trying to achieve is, is like a next steps to, to the great benchmark that, that the GET team provided some, some time, some time ago. Uh, we would like to build an automated tool for building, for, for benchmarking the, the clients. The, the third project is, is of cryptographic nature. It's on zero knowledge machine learning, learning ZKML. So in, when you look at models that the operations you are doing are usually a floating point arithmetics operations and such, op such arithmetics are not particularly friendly to, to ZK, which, uh, relations are defined over finite field. So what you do, usually you cast floating point arithmetics to to, to finite field, but then you need to, to take care about overflow, overflow errors. And basically you need to, to check at each layer that you haven't overflow. So you would like to, to see if we can use tools like lookup arguments to, to speed up, to speed up these, these process. We are also looking into using folding schemes and a new hot thing in zero knowledge to, to speed up. ZKML computation. Last but not least, yeah, Remco, you, you mentioned that and this builder, you, you mentioned about network effect for the world coin. The final proposal tackles on, on, on these two things. So show, showing that you are human and might be available only for, for, for some limited set of, of people. And you would like to take the network effect of WorldCoin, of World ID further on. One of the alternatives for, for proving humanity are social graph based proof of proof of personhood. And they're okay, but they, they have uh, some, some limitations. However, their limitations are like in a bit different place compared to, to the limitations of hardware based proof of personhood. So what we propose is to build a social graph based proof of person pool where the community will be seeded by the world ID, world ID holders. So when in a social graph based proof of personhood, people vote for each other, say that they believe that the other party is human, we would like to have the world ID holders that will make the first vote and onboard people who didn't have a uh, possibility of using R to also get some of the upsides of this huge world ID, world ID system. Thanks. Thank you. That is a lot and really shows the 
diversity of talent that exists at Nethermines. Again, thank you all for joining in and thank you all for applying with these wonderful, wonderful ideas. Let's go build.